Hey, Nathan, last time we got together, we did a video talking about stuff we wish automakers would bring back. That is correct. And this time we're doing something different. We're calling this one Get Rid of Them. Yeah, the last one was We Want It Back. Things like pop-up headlights. Yeah, T-tops. T-tops. Well, that was your idea, not yeah. mine. And you can check that out, of course, at alltfl.com. But today, we're talking about technology that makes our lives worse, makes driving actually less fun, and makes interacting with your or my car less engaging. I would agree on all those accounts. And a lot of these, we know have good reasons for existing, and there is a debate about some of these, and that's the whole point of this, is we're gonna generate a little bit of debate, but some of these just suck. Yeah, let's start with typical TFL fashion at number 10 and work our way down to number one. That is correct, and number 10 is subscriptions. Oh, what a bad, bad, bad idea, automakers. You know, I mean, uh, if it isn't enough that we have to pay for music, for videos, for gym memberships, for, well, pretty much everything now, on Naughty Magazine subscription. <laughs> That's you, Nathan, not oh, me. I, oh. Both online and offline, now automakers are, of course, getting into the uh, game with Tesla leading the way, of course, with like autopilot and full self-driving and uh, other automakers now doing... Toyota and BMW, too. They're right there. Doing things like, uh, you know, floating ideas that even if your car does have heated seats, Nathan, you're going to have to pay a monthly fee to use them. Yes. Now, that is not official here in the United States, but overseas they are pulling those particular tricks. Now, for those of you who don't know, what's happening is that automakers are starting to look at subscriptions for different types of things that you take for granted, and it could be even heated seats, and I watch, it's going to be heated steering wheels one of these days. You'll get the seats, but not the steering wheel, unless you pay us nine ninety nine a month. And, you know, Polestar does things like if you want more horsepower, you're going to pay a subscription fee. Uh, and it's just, you know, the problem with it, there's, well, two problems. First of all, uh, it's frustrating because you feel like you're buying the car. And then you're leasing parts of it. I know. That, yeah. Am I buying it or am I not buying it? But more importantly, I think it, it also does not speak well for the brand that's doing it, right? I agree. It, 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 make, it makes like BMW seem like a dollar store. Pick one, guys. You know, if you want to be BMW, then take pride in the fact that you build, what was their slogan, Nathan? Uh, best driving cars in the world or what's the ultimate driving machine. Right. The ultimate driving machine does not charge you to heat your bun. <laughs> At least that in my mind. Yeah. And the other part of it is that there's some people out there who work really hard to get that big down payment down, they're making the payments on the car. Hey, everything's great. I'm able to afford this car. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, you want me to do subscriptions for what? Now, we already pay subscriptions for those of you who have satellite radio like I do. And that in itself kind of sucks. But imagine just adding more and more to it for small features that really should be included. So that is a huge gripe that we have, and I'm curious to your take and, on but it. But there's a way you could do that. Like I was thinking what you could do is uh, with digital dis instrument clusters now, you could add value, not subtract value, and then make you pay for it, but actually add value by doing things like, hey, you want an E36 uh, cluster? You could have that, right? A classic cluster from a previous BMW. I would pay for that, but this idea of charging things that, you know, for the last 50 years have been part and parcel of the vehicle is just wrong. Okay, I agree. So what you're saying is like new innovation paying for some stuff like for like extra. That. Yeah. yeah. Not something that already came or But comes. the basics, we both agree, should not have to go onto a subscription basis. It's ridiculous. Unless you're leasing the car. It's a different story. All right, the next one is haptic and non-haptic feedback, basically pushing on screens or basically flat plastic in order to make something happen, as opposed to ooh, a good old-fashioned button that has a proper actuator that makes things happen. You know what's the uh, worst example of that? Mm. Mercedes had perfected the seat uh, actuator mm. mechanism, right? They had yeah. a little seat on the side of the door. Right there on the door. And you would push on the bottom cushion, it would go forward, and you push backward on the bottom, it would go backward, you'd push on the on the top Lumbar cushion. And, yeah, 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 and it worked brilliantly. It every, was great. Every, and then they went to a haptic version of that, and now you like you like push on it, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the seat bottom like jumps up. And you're like, no, that's not what I wanted. Right. It's so it's still there on the door, right? Right, but it's but, haptic. But but it, it no longer is a switch that moves back and forth. It's now got a little screen thing that you touch and it moves and it's ridiculous. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a good idea. Volkswagen also did that with their latest ID4, uh, where they did that for the volume uh, and temperature. And then the other problem with it is oftentimes, for some mysterious reason, they're not uh, lit up at night. <laughs> so then you I know. <laughs> try, like, or, try to feel for this, this switch and, and then you can't see some, it. Some, the haptic is when you push and you actually feel something kick in and then it's like, okay, maybe I hit it. And then the other ones, the cheaper ones, you push and it's just like a dead screen. You don't know if you actually activated it. And then you have to look. You have to take your eyes off the road and look and find your finger placement. Whereas in a proper button, you actually feel it go in, you feel it go out. You sound like my prom date. But the, the point is, is that you, know, you actually feel these things happen and it works. And it has worked for years and years and years and they got rid you of know, it. You know who else messed that up? Honda. They went back to a regular audio a knob. Yeah. They had this kind of like uh, thing on the steering wheel that you'd move your thumb up and down. Yeah, that, like, that like a little ladder. It didn't work very well. No, it also didn't work. Yeah, very and well. then enough people like us complained about it and they fixed it, which is great. The next one is shifting. Push button and rotary shifters, I personally hate. And a lot of people are doing it and I wish they wouldn't. Yeah, you know, reinventing the shifter and has become a thing. And the reason the manufacturers give is because it clears up space, right? Where uh, there used to be a shifter. It, that's, now such, you, that's a crop. Now you can have, like, uh, cup holders. You could – guess what? You could in the past. I have a shifter, right? And I still have two cup holders and all these other controls I can play with. And the shifter only takes up about 6 by 8 inches. Now – a push button setup is about the same size. It just doesn't come out. It doesn't have anything that comes out. A rotary, now that can sit in different places, sure. But when you're making a nine-point turn, <laughs> snap, 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 back and forth on a rotary, it sucks. Or on a push button or push and pull system. <laughs> oh, I know. And uh, GMs. Yeah, the, oh, yeah, I know. No bueno. You push and pull and you pull and you pull. Well, now, they have column shifters, and some of you guys are like, well, why don't we go back to that? And I actually tend to agree. Old school column shifters, Mercedes still uses them, Tesla uses them. And it's not really a shifter per se. It's just, you know, an actuator that puts you into gear. And that frees up all this space as well. You really don't have anything that it's blocking. So there's, in my mind, there's no real reason to have this other than the fact that all uh, transmissions are wire controlled, you know, push, you know, push button wire. And so having an actuator that actually goes back and forth like a handle, as opposed to a button. No, it's very, it's very uh, tactile and it's very uh, satisfying, right? When you when you pull a car with a real shifter into gear, better yet, a manual, right? Because what happens, like in a manual, for instance, is there's this amount of control that you feel that you have over the machine, like where you engage the clutch, right? These are just wonderful things that make driving fun. You're and, connected, and all these things basically disconnect you from the vehicle. It becomes like a computer where there's no uh, physical, no uh, emotional, or in some ways, no even intellectual attachment to it. It's just a toaster mm -hmm. that does what it's supposed to do, but it's no fun doing it. Agreed. Now, I know electric vehicles all have some form of push button and whatnot, and I agree. That's the, they, they work. They do their basic job, but it's very different with an internal combustion car. Also, something to point out, uh, I, I'm a slob. And so when I'm drinking my coffee as I'm driving, I do spill from time to time. And I did once spill in a Honda that had, or sorry, an Acura that had a push button. And then having that sticky feeling when you're actuating, you know, drive, it really sucks. So that's just to keep that in mind. Let's move on to the next one, which is also a button, and that's stop, start. Yeah, so the reason, obviously, for that is it does save on a lot of uh, fuel. It can. Yeah, it can give you up to one MPG more uh, per gallon. Uh, it, so it's give substantial. Or but the downside, of course, is... Uh, on the, just on the slightly annoying part, the whole vehicle like kind of you know shutters when it stops and then shutters when it starts. Depending on the vehicle, like a golf cart, yeah. Depending on the vehicle, but you also lose things like either heaters or air conditioning, and that's when it gets really annoying, right? Once again, depending on cars, some yeah. of them can keep things going seamlessly. But my issue is actually the loss of power at traffic when you want to accelerate. Now, some of them, some of these systems are are, re are pretty damn good, and they're almost seamless, especially on some hybrids, but. When you come to a light and you stop and everything shuts off and then the light goes on and you have to get going, let's say you have a dual clutch, let's say you have a turbo. Two things that already create a little bit of a lag, right? And then you have to start, stop. All of a sudden, it's like you've lost a full second at the light before everything kicks in and you're moving again. I don't like having to pause. So for me personally, when I have a vehicle like that that I feel is going to stop at a stop, stop, start, not stop, 
Stop start. start. Thank you. Um, that vehicle, I will shut off, if I can, the stop start system. Yeah, but it'll always come back on. And it'll always come back, back on, on when yeah, you're because, actually yeah, done with because it. Because if, if you're the EPA, the only way you're going to get that better fuel economy is if you have that thing automatically come back on, if you're wondering after uh, the next key cycle. Now, the next one is, uh, I know for you, a big thorny thing, and that's biometrics. Oh, gosh, yeah. Like, there are certain cars that now have biometrics where you put your finger on a little reader like you, you know you do on a computer mm -hmm. uh, or face recognition. Uh, once again, I don't want my car being a hackable computer, which then can affect other parts of my life. You know what I mean? I just want my car to be a car I drive and take me to places. I really don't want it to be so technologically advanced that it's recognizing me as a person. That just goes down a really dangerous and slippery slope. I, I am perfectly content to have a small key fob in my pocket where I can go up to the car. It either will open when I come there or, or there's like a little button on the uh, pull handle and that unlocks the door. It, it's, it's no big deal. You get inside the car, you push a button to start the car and everything's easy and simple. I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is a vehicle that knows my intimates and, you know, says, wait a minute. Are you sure you're Nathan? I don't know if you're Nathan. Or if I sliced my finger, which I actually one time did, and I wasn't able to log on to one of my uh, computers. These things do happen. Believe it or not, it's true. So I, I mean, I, how long before that stuff gets hacked and then gets sold well, on the dark exactly web it. and I, then gets used for nefarious reasons? You it's know completely I mean? unnecessary. Yeah, and it's it's why do I want to put myself my, my fingerprint or my face out there in that way? Of course, you can get it off of YouTube. You can get my face off of this. I get that, but... Really, I don't want my car recognizing me. I'm not that close with my car. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want I, to be that close with my car. <laughs> honestly, and I know some people say it's theft de deterrent, but I, the, the modern key fob system, I think, is a pretty good one. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. The whole point here is to have you guys respond. The next one is, oh, interior camera. So speaking of biometrics and how it works. Yeah, we had a Tesla Model Y, and it had an interior camera, and I put a piece of tape on that. I have put a, I put a piece of tape on my computer too. Uh, once again, I don't want people looking at me who can hack the car, who can hack the computer. Who can, I know why it's there. It's there to make sure that if you're using autonomous driving systems that you're paying attention. Uh, there are some other excuses that like uh, Tesla gave, but the fact is, once again, I don't want the car recognizing me. I don't need the car recognizing me. It's just a bit of uh, intrusive tech that doesn't need to be in a car and doesn't really get much upside, but there's a huge potential downside. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of it. I actually have a little tiny image of Macron, and I put it on my computer thing so people think I'm the president of France. Hey, here's something that we used to be able to do, which we can't do. Hey, you want to borrow a truck, Nathan? Here you go. Yeah, thanks for that. Oh, wait a minute. No, no it won't can't. let me drive, Roman. Sorry, I went inside and it told me, no, you're not Roman. I'm sorry, you, you can't you, drive me. So that's number four. When you, Like the latest Tundra does this. We're actually latest... Uh, Toyota system does this, and yeah. so does Audi now. Driver profiles. Driver profiles. Oh, God. And in order for you to drive some of these vehicles properly, I should say, to properly drive some of these vehicles and have all, everything working properly, you actually have to log in or create a profile. Dude, what? No, bad, bad Toyota. No, we don't like that. You, you, you guys don't like it either. You know what happens? Here's the crux of this. You know, a lot of the millennials out there will be like, you guys are just a bunch of old guys. Yes, you know? we are. We are. That's true. But your but, mother likes but, me. But we were also around when Facebook came out, and it was just supposed to be an app that lets you connect with your friends. And <laughs> see how that turned out, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> see how that YouTube thing turned out, too. My God, look <laughs> what happened with that. No, it, but, but things grow. Things tend to change, and they evolve, and we get that. And we know that a lot of systems have to go through some teething issues before they can be properly used. However... The fact is, is that if I want my kid to go drive my vehicle and it's like, oh, crap, here, here's the key, but you still have to do a profile if you want to use the stereo properly or if you want to use Apple CarPlay, sorry. So take another five minutes while your arm is bleeding and your mom's in the backseat passed out before you get to the hospital. Sorry. I, whatever. It, you, you get my point here, right? We, we just, yes, we're old, but at the same time. We're right. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is something actually you don't like, which I do. I hate I hate uh, uh, HUD heads, uh, he heads up displays because I wear polar polarized glasses and I can't see them. And even if I can't, if even if I can see them, I got to find inevitably the control that you know kind of puts the HUD in the right place so it's in my right. Yeah, line because of sight. You're, you're tall. Because yeah. sometimes it used to be there was a button like on the left side that it would move it up and down, which but, was simple. But now they've moved it somewhere 15 pages into the <laughs> yeah. screen, uh, and I find that information to be redundant anyway so if I want to know how fast I'm going I can just look down and I get the same information like the, the second I guess if you're a fighter pilot 
that half a second or whatever the hell it is could mean the difference between life or death. But, you know, I'm driving around now while people are texting entire Bibles to their friends. And yet somehow, you know, that half a second that you save from looking down versus looking straight ahead doesn't seem like a big deal. See, I like them. But I, I agree with you about the whole polarized thing. It's kind of funny. If you twist your head, by the way, you can still see <laughs> if you're wearing polarized glasses, you can actually see them. It's, it's the way the glasses are, the polarization setup. But um, at night, especially uh, the newer ones that actually integrate uh, directions when you're heading somewhere, it, it, I think they're really valuable. I like heads-up displays. And I remember the first time I saw one on a, on a Corvette, years and years and years and years ago, I freaked out. I thought it was the coolest thing I ever saw. So some people like them, some people don't like them, some people find them redundant. You can always shut it off, which I like, the fact that you can kill it. Most cars will let you completely get rid of it. Uh, but in my case, yeah, if I had it, I'd love it. Yeah, the only one I like actually is Mercedes has a system where it over or superimposes the arrow directional over the hood of the car when you're using navigation. So mm -hmm. it's not like here where the screen is, it's like where the hood ends. And so you come up to like a, let's say, T junction. Yeah, the way they make it look. Yeah, and they'll yeah. do like an arrow going this way so you know exactly which way to go. And I think I think that is pretty innovative. It's uh, cool. But in general, you know, whether it's a tachometer, speedometer, uh, the other one that's super annoying, here's one that actually is super annoying where they put the speed limit up there and then it starts flashing or turns red when you I exceed it. I hate oh, that. Oh, God. Dang it, that is annoying. I know yeah. I've exceeded the speed limit. It's 45, and I've accelerated to 47 by accident. And now the car's like, 45, 45, 45. My it's, God, you're going to explode. It's so naggy. Knock that off. God. Yeah. That, that, now, I, I, I'm fine with them having, you know, on the navigation screen where it shows what the speed limit is and just simply shows what that is in the area you're in. Fine. But when it's flashing and screaming at you and all that about, you know, possibly exceeding the speed limit if you're passing somebody. I mean, who doesn't exceed the speed limit? You know, just on Tommy a regular basis. never does. Tommy right, just, never just, does. <laughs> I think, never, it, I think does. everybody does. It's just Tommy never does. It's just part of driving. I, it, yeah, and I'm not the reality, saying by 50 miles. I, I do wish you could just simply defeat that and get rid of it. Um, and I think maybe there is a way in some cars. Speaking of that type of thing, driver assistance systems is number two on our list. Yeah. And anything that shakes the steering wheel, vibrates the seat, gives you a dope slap. I hate. Now I like vibrating seats, especially if I can direct <laughs> the vibration to a spot I want. But <laughs> you can't do that yet, which sucks. But you know what? I, it's a funny thing. I don't mind driver assistance to a certain degree. I have lane keep assist. And sometimes that kind of comes in handy, you know, going around a corner and it kind of like, oh, yeah, you, you, here, here's a better way it, to go it, through like, that corner. It like scares the heck out of me. I'm driving and all of a sudden the wheel is almost yanked out of my hand. Depends on the car. Works. Yeah, it depends on the car. Some are gentle and some are not. I don't like being beeped at when I'm going from one lane to another. I don't like it when it's being overly... Um, Cautious Anything when nanny. If it's nanny. Well, yeah, but also I've almost crashed because of these things. I was on a Honda Pilot. I was making a U-turn, and as I was and legal U-turn, as I was making the U-turn, it saw a vehicle which was completely legal where it was sitting, and it hit the brakes because as I'm making the U-turn, I got kind of close to a car, and it figured, oh no, you got to stop. You're gonna crash, and it's like, dude, I'm making a freaking U-turn. I'm in the middle of the intersection right now, and you stopped me, and that really freaked me out. And I've had other issues. You had a Tesla issue once where it like saw a shadow. Yeah, I saw a shadow across the road and it went in emergency braking by itself. And yeah, then on the highway. On the highway that almost no bueno rear-ended me because the car all of a sudden went emergency out of nowhere. So Full yeah, that's, lock. yeah. So driver assistance systems are still not there yet, and and that's an issue I think both of us have problems with. And the final one I hate. I'm not sure about you. Sound augmentation. Now, what I'm referring to is essentially inside the cabin as you're driving, your exhaust note is being augmented by the stereo or by some extra wizardry to make it sound more manly or more beefy or something like that. And if it's not the real exhaust note, I can't stand it. I hate that system. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. As true, I think, uh, car guys, right, we like everything that's authentic, right? Yeah. And be that fake hood scoops be that, you know, silly um, spoilers or arrow that just makes a vehicle look into something that's not what it is, like a poser, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, all that kind of makes it feel inauthentic, makes it feel just like it's trying to be something that it's not. And I think most people don't like things or people that are trying to be what it's not. Just be what you are. And if you want, a, you know, if you want a, the V8 exhaust note, then get a V8. Right, and but what I've known... It, Don't get a V6 that sounds like a V8. I talked to an engineer years ago. This is when I first... Uh, a Ford... Um, oh, the, it was the Ford uh, ST, the uh, Focus ST. Yeah. And that had augmented sound. 
And he explained to me that it just, you know, gives the person a little bit more passion. And he said, in the future, you're going to see cars that have almost no sound with augmented notes. And the whole point of that is so people understand that they're going high RPM or low RPM. That was his point. I get that. And I also know that on electric vehicles, they need to actually have augmentation, especially on the outside of the vehicle. It has to make some sort of noise for safety. I get that as well. But I really am referring to the fact that for some people, having a vehicle that's not really making the sound that you're hearing as you're driving, especially if it's a performance vehicle, uh, I don't like that at all. Yeah, it kind of takes away from the uh, mechanical beauty of what you've bought, right? It's it's like the difference between buying a motorcycle that is, uh, you know, fully kitted out with all kinds of like plastic on it and getting the naked bike. The yeah. naked bike takes you back to what that thing was, right? So you hear the induction, you hear the valves, you hear the push rods, if it's a push rod, right? Mm. It, it all kind of becomes this uh, symphony of mechanical sound uh, that talks to the craftsmanship that went into making that vehicle, right? Yeah. And, and there are car companies, Ferrari, Ford, with some of their V8s, General Motors, right, that, that, that worked very hard to create these magnificent motors and engines that created uh, this incredible symphony of mechanical noise that spoke to the engineers that built it. Mm -hmm. And when you, you know, paste that over with a Band-Aid, it, it, it just all goes away and it makes the car much less interesting to me. I agree. Uh, and much less of a passionate work of art and much more of a commodity. Yeah, and let's face it, we know that uh, you know hybrids are here to stay and a lot of hybrids don't really make much noise, even if they have plenty of power. And a lot of the vehicles I'm referring to do are indeed hybrids. So it's just something that personally speaking, look, some of you guys might like it, and I'm curious to, to read your comments below, but I'm just not a big fan of it. So let's end this video uh, with a quick clip that I recorded uh, at the uh, Chicago Auto Show. We've got the new e-muscle car coming out. You know, the... Mm -hmm. uh, oh, gosh. It's, it's the a, Dodge. The Dodge. What is it? The long... Daytona Charger mm -hmm. something, something something EV something. Anyway, something. They, they've created actually... Um, not a synthesized sound to make no, this it's thing. No, it's a real sound, but it's not being generated by any it, motors. Yeah, it's being generated by almost like a woodwind instrument. Like it's like a... Uh, it's a gazoo. It's like a gazoo or like, a, like an organ. And uh, they keep retuning it to make it a little bit more, I guess, muscle car-y. Uh, so let's play that video clip right now for you guys. And let us know in the comments below, because obviously electric cars don't make any sound. Where do you stand on, you know, electric cars now having this kind of unique sound signature, uh, especially electric muscle cars, and do you like it or do you not like it? I'm curious. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for that clip. Ciao. All right, here we go. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? So the cool thing about that, the cool thing about that is it's not actually a speaker. It's actually like a tube. And the blood pass through it. So it's like an organ, really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so more expensive than this.